so Marco, are you uh, are you good to go? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, great. And Lily, are you good? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. Okay, well, it's uh, four o'clock. Uh, we have 55 people on, and I guess we'll have more to come. So welcome everybody, and thank you for attending. Uh, this is kind of the second part of our series on personal protection and um, what we wanted to do today was to actually um, just maybe update you on uh, the use of personal protective equipment obviously a very hot topic and uh, just maybe go over some of the uh, issues and then kind of finish off with some other personal uh, management issues that you can do um, at home before you come to work during work and and uh, going home a lot of that comes from other um, things that we've been looking up on the internet. And so, um, so there we are. So this is the outline, um, just to kind of bring people up to date on the personal protective equipment. We have a resource center, and maybe Marco, you could just uh, kind of click on it. So there's a resource center within the Department of Surgery. And in there, we're trying to place some of the important links that we see on uh, the COVID uh, components. Um, is it uh, coming up? If you double click it, Marco. Yeah, so there's, so in there, you'll have the, the ground rounds that we've been having. Uh, so we'll put them up, including the slides and the video presentations. And then we'll have different sections um, that, are, that we think are important. If you have a link that you think would be very important to share, then please send it to us and we'll uh, try to put it up as well. So just go back to the previous slide, uh, Marco. There's one in particular I just want to bring your attention to. It's under uh, protocols. And uh, this is one that's uh, written by the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital, and it's supposed to be updated on a regular basis. And uh, if you go through it, there's a, it's, it's, it's fairly well done. It's very short to the point, uh, but it has a lot of good information. And also it has some references when there are references uh, to be had on that particular uh, area of interest. So it might be good for you just to look at some of the areas that uh, are important for you. And um, I think hopefully this will be a, an ongoing uh, resource that we can, we can use. So this one is also on the Department of Surgery link resource website. Okay, we'll go back to the, yeah. So just a few things of notes, just to remind people to do social distancing in the hospital. Uh, we've noticed that the residents are just huddling as if um, nothing had changed, even uh, nursing and staff. So just be sure that you do the distancing in the hospital as well. You never know who is going to be infected. And obviously, we're at much higher risk to be infected than anybody else. Um, we're going to review the uh, personal protective protocol and uh, really kind of try to emphasize ju the judicious use of N95 respirators. As you know, um, some of you who haven't been fit tested, uh, there is no more fit testing being done. And uh, I, I, there are a number of reasons for that. I would suspect that some of them is that they don't wanna um, use up all of the masks. That's my own theory. It's, it hasn't been told to me that way, but looking around in other places such as in New York where they're being overrun, these masks are of, uh, of high priority to keep. So instead of fit testing, it's going to be what we call a fit check. So basically, you, you take an N95 mask and you check it, and, and Marco will go over how you how you do that. Um, we'll also try to summarize some of the donning and doffing, and it does change with respect to the location of where that might happen. So. In the operating room, for example, we'll have to revamp a bit some of the um, teaching that was being done about the doffing specifically in the operating room. I'm sorry, may I, are we allowed to ask questions? Uh, I think the best thing to do is at this time, uh, just use the chat and okay. uh, we'll, at the end, 
uh, or near the middle of the uh, discussion, we'll try to answer them, okay? Okay. Uh, finally, we'd like to go along some of the common issues that we found when we've been teaching people donning and doffing. So just for you that are going to be using it clinically. Uh, we also have a list of champions and then Lily would like to finish off with some of the safety issues uh, before, during and after work. So I'm just going to let uh, Marco now continue with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. LaChapelle. Oh. Again, if you have questions, just please use the chat. So we'll be starting, uh, obviously everything that's gonna be in red will be the updated from the most recent MUHC protocols from infection control. So we'll just start with suspected or confirmed COVID patients. So these are all the patients that we're gonna be um, seeing or caring for. And when we say suspected, obviously that includes patients that have fever, chills, dyspnea, sore throat, rhinorrhea, diarrhea, vomiting, headache, acute loss of smell, or syncope or general fatigue. So this is the group of patients that we're considering. So any patient that's either suspected or confirmed COVID, in addition to being critically ill or doing a aerosol generating medical procedure, and we're gonna go through those. So critically ill is broken down into either adult or pediatric, either representing severe respiratory distress. So at the bottom of the screen, I have greater or um, uh, than four liters of uh, per minute of oxygen or FiO2 of 35% by face mask with a saturation of greater than 90%, any altered mental status or shock. And in the pediatric population is, is similar in terms of respiratory distress and any signs of dehydration, lethargy, loss of consciousness or shock. And in all those patients, that's when we're considering the airborne in addition to droplet contact. So that means you need an N95 mask with face shield, you need a gown, you need gloves, and ideally you need to be in a negative pressure room. They give the caveat that if you're not able to obtain a negative pressure room, then you have to place the patient in a single room with the door closed. For everyone else, all the other suspected or confirmed patients, these ones were doing droplet in contact. That means you're going to be using a surgical mask or a mask with a visor, a gown, gloves, and you'll be doing this in a single room with the door closed. And what's important, just to touch up this on the, the gowns, so obviously any low-risk soiling, that means you're not expecting to be in contact with that much bodily fluids, you'll be using the yellow disposable gowns. For cases where you're going to be in risk for uh, you know, vomitous, large amounts of blood or whatnot, in that case, that's when you want the impermeable blue gowns. So this is the, the overall summary slide of it. Now we're going to go into a bit more detail in the different aspects of this. Of course, Aerosol generating medical procedures. These are the ones that are up yet, and there's constantly more and more procedures that are being added uh, on an almost regular basis at the MUHC. Uh, it includes intubation, different types of ventilation, even non invasive ventilation with face mask or high flow nasal prongs, um, including uh, laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, CPR, cardiopulmonary pulmonary resuscitation, any sputum induction, any endoscopy, as well as dental procedures for now. And I'll touch back on this right at the end of the talk as well. So any, any patient that we're having suspected or confirmed COVID, so these are, and they're critically ill or you're doing a procedure on them, of course, you're doing a droplet, airborne, and contact. So these are the ones we're really using where the N95 mask is necessary. Um, so just a, a summary of this. So obviously the first step we're gonna be doing is washing our hands. And this is done all outside the patient's room, of course. You're gonna be placing on the gown and the gown will depend on if you're expecting or anticipating there to be a lot of uh, bodily fluids or not. So if the patient is you know, vomiting, if there's a lot of secretions or blood involved, then obviously you're going to be gowning in the blue and permeable gown. If not, the default is the yellow disposable gown. Once that's done, you're going to be putting your N95 respirator and performing the seal test. Now, now the difference with this is obviously once you put on your respirator itself, like usual, and we'll, we'll reference the previous videos uh, that were shown, you want to make sure that there's no air escaping superiorly on the sides of your mask as well as at the, at the bottom of your mask. And this is where you take a deep breath to make sure that the mask sucks into your face, and then you exhale sharply three times to make sure that there's no seal coming out. Obviously, if there's a seal, you might have to adjust the nasal breath Bridge. If not, you might have to get an, another mask that's more appropriate for your size. Um, the next step, once that's done, is placing your face shield, which covers the entirety of the face, and then putting on your gloves. And then the last step is getting checked, making sure your buddy is ensuring that you're adequately covered, and then you could enter the room. Regarding the summary of the doffing, 
So this is, this is quite important. Obviously, you're going to start re removing your gloves. If you're wearing, uh, and then you're going to wash your hands after that. Then you're going to move your yellow gown and wash your hands. Of course, if you're wearing one of those blue impermeable gowns, you'll do it very similar to when we're in the operating room and we remove our gown and gloves at the same time, breaking it uh, at the, the tie at the waist and then breaking the tie at the neck and rolling it into a ball inside out. The next step after that, obviously, is removing the face shield and then washing your hands, and then you're exiting the patient's room. And this is where we're gonna go into the location of the doffing afterwards. And then you wash your hands once that's done. Once you're outside the patient's room, that's when you're gonna be removing your N95 respirator and washing your hands, and then you'll be ready to go. When we look at all, yep. Uh, is there a question? I think it's good, uh, Marco. Yeah. Uh, maybe if everyone could just mute their mics uh, when they log in. When we're looking at all the other patients, I mean, they're not critically ill or they're not having any aerosol generating medical procedure. That's when we're looking at the mask with visor, a gown. Obviously, that depends on if you're going to be in exposure to a large amount of body fluids or not, gloves. And you'll be in a single room with the door closed. And in, and in these cases... The summary is obviously you start washing your hands, you place your gown, you place your mask with the visor. This is where it's, the mask with the visor is adequate and suitable uh, as a personal protection. You'll be placing on your gloves and then of course you'll be checked with, by the buddy and then you'll be able to enter the room. Of course with the doffing at every step you're washing your hands and that's the same thing either if you have the N95 mask or the regular face mask. When you're removing your equipment, of course, you're doing from dirty to clean. Your gloves are the most dirty. And obviously, you're doing from back to front because the back of your, of your gown, your face shield and whatnot are a lot more cleaner than the front of them. And this, the technique is very similar in terms of removing it, uh, uh, as I mentioned above. But now the only difference is when you're removing your mask and visor, it's advised to be a about two meters away from the patient. And the whole reason for this two meters away is that around the patient, roughly around two meters, that's where the droplets are. And once we exit that zone, you're, you're not at risk of getting exposed to it and you're able to remove your mask. Of course, if it's not possible to remove your mask two meters away, then they advise you actually exit the room and you take out your mask at that point. So just to review it, so obviously you'll remove your gloves, you'll wash your hands right after. You'll untie and remove your gown. You'll wash your hands. You'll remove your mask with your visor. Then you'll wash your hands. Then you'll exit the patient's room and wash your hands. In terms of common areas, so we did a, we did a few simulations on the personal protective equipment on the different COVID, uh, COVID units and some of the common issues that are coming up. So one thing that's very important is trying to really ensure you have a buddy. That might not necessarily be a medical colleague. It might be actually uh, another, an allied healthcare professional, a nurse, or anyone that's around that could really double check and make sure that when you're putting on your equipment, and more importantly, when you're doff, when you're doffing your equipment, that you're not self-contaminating just for your own overall well-being, so that they could they could advise you if you need to re wash your hands or if you contaminate part of your arm or whatnot. Of course, another common issue that you've probably thought about is that the definition of aerosol generating medical procedures is quite varied. And you know that each to their own specialty have realized that different procedures themselves expose um, us to different risks, and namely in otolaryngology with our tracheotomies. This is something where we have to develop our own protocols related to this. And I imagine in every different specialty, cardiac surgery, urology, vascular surgery, general surgery, or whatnot, there's different um, procedures that you might do that might need to be thought of, of what's the best approach for them. Of course, um, the next question comes is considering trauma patients or patients when you cannot assess their COVID status. And right now it's been assumed that if you cannot assess the COVID status, then you assume a positive COVID until you're able to either do the testing or screen the patient appropriately. And that means you need to wear the recommended personal protective equipment for a, a critically ill patient. That includes N95 mask, face shield, gown, and gloves. Another common error that was discussed is the gloves overlapping the gown. Sometimes the yellow gowns themselves don't have wrist covers. And if you have broader shoulders or a, a larger torso, sometimes that will give you a wrist show. So it's important, you just gotta be self-aware of that and try to cover it. And you know, other methods that we've shown is sometimes putting a hole in the yellow sleeve itself to keep the wrist um, covered itself by the gown. 
Of course, another very important step is always to wash your hands after every step of the doffing procedure and removing all your personal equipment, including your face mask, usually inside the patient's room. And I'll discuss that in the next slides. Um, and keeping your mask on until you, you leave or when you have a mask advisor when you're more than two meters away from the patient itself. In terms of the location of the doffing, so this is something that's just important to just to understand. So most rooms are gonna be negative pressure rooms and then the hallway itself uh, yeah, obviously is normal pressured. So in these cases, it's exactly as it is. You take out your gloves, you take out your gown. Uh, obviously you're washing hands in between every procedure and you're taking out your face mask. Then you exit the room and that's when you take out your respirator. In some rooms, there's actually an anti-chamber room and that's like a separate room or room outside the patient's room that is either differently pressured or pressured uh, in an alternate sense. So when we look at the bottoms of the screen, we see that we're removing the gloves, the gown, and then the face shield. We're exiting the room itself and that's where we're taking out the respirator. And then once we get out of the antechamber room, we rewash our hands again, and then we're able to continue our clinical duties. The only difference in these cases is when we're going to the operating room. So usually the operating rooms are positively pressured, and they're associated or coupled with an antechamber room that's negatively pressured. Um, and in these cases, it's recommended to remove, and this is something that's a change from what we were told, and the, the protocol actually just changed partly today at the MUHC, is where you're gonna remove your gloves, your gown, and your face shield um, in the antechamber room. And then there's a bit of controversy in terms of where to remove your N95 respirator, if it's gonna be in the antechamber room or the, in the hallway. On the graph here by infection uh, prevention and control, they recommend removing it uh, uh, once you leave the antechamber room itself. Of course, you're gonna to have to wash your hands after every consecutive step. We're gonna go through questions shortly. I just wanna go through one last thing, which is the list of surgical champions. So almost every division in the Department of Surgery um, has a list of attending surgeons as well as residents uh, that'd be willing to help train or diffuse the message in terms of uh, how to use personal protective equipment. So if you wanna just take a note and I'll be sharing these slides uh, under the resource section. Um, of course, we also have the full video um, of the different parts of the donning and doffing that will be available too. So we'll stop here for now for questions and then Dr. Nguyen will carry on um, with the safety at work and at home. Okay, <clears throat> maybe what I could do is just go over some of the uh, questions from the chat room. Um, there's a question here. Have we looked at ways to re-sterilize N95 masks? Duke has a protocol for that. And I thank you, Carol, because uh, you've sent us the protocol. So we'll send that on as well. Um, we have a question uh, from uh, Nagy. Uh, has the MUHC contacted local industry currently producing re reusable PEEs? I know a company in Montreal that's currently doing that. So I would say that I had a similar contact about someone making masks. I called Michael Ciancini, who's apparently the um, head of uh, procurement. And uh, if you want, Nagy, you can email me and I'll get you his uh, telephone number. And uh, he, he wants uh, emails sent directly to his uh, address uh, with the contact information they're supposed to get uh, in touch with these people. Uh, I have another one from Nader. Very difficult to do proper donning and doffing in small clinic space after nasal pharyngoscopy. Shall we stay in room for 30 minutes with patients sitting in close proximity before doffing? Should the patient leave the room before we uh, doff? I don't know if the room, I, I'm assuming the room is uh, a regular pressure room. Uh, in which case I suppose you would do all of the um, doffing uh, apart from the mask in the room. I don't know how much, I, I, how much aerosolization that uh, produces. I don't know. Uh, can you comment, Lily, on this question from Nader? Yeah, so uh, we met with infection control. Um, ideally is that if you have um, a, you also need to know of a negative pressure room, how long it takes for the ventilation to cycle through. So some of them take 35 minutes, some of them take uh, 75 minutes. So if you are in a normal pressure room, 
ideally is that you allow the aerosols to settle down on the ground. But they recognize that you cannot, as a physician, stay in the room for 35 minutes. So in that case, you want to leave the room quickly, close the door, open the door as least open as possible. And if is able to stay there for 35 minutes to have things settle then you can leave or the patient can leave with you right away but the door needs to be closed for however long it takes for um, the air to circulate and that depends on what type of ventilation system that you have if you don't know then you go for 70 minutes if you are in a net pressure room then you can open the door and come in and out and you're fine Okay, thank you, Lily. Um, is there a scientific reason not to test asymptomatic patients? Uh, I'm not an expert, obviously, but I would think that one of the issues has to do with the number of reagents that are available for testing. And so they want to test what they think uh, where people uh, could be positive. If someone's completely asymptomatic and has never been in contact and is, hasn't traveled, and there are no other risk factors, I don't uh, think uh, that would be the case, except I guess if the patient was gonna have surgery in our hospital. So I think it's something that that is moving, it's a moving target. Um, will this session be recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. We got the protocol from Duke. Uh, John Chen asked about double gloving. Uh, it's not recommended at the MUHC, and as a last step, you're gonna be washing your hands, so technically uh, you don't need. Uh, Greg Berry asks for the documentation. Please remind us where to find the link to the Brigham document. So the link for the Brigham document is under the link for the resources. Uh, this presentation will be there. We'll send out another link uh, to make sure every, or another email to make sure everybody has the links. Uh, this is from Elisa. In many places, uh, people are removing all equipment in antechamber, including mask for droplet. Is this okay? I think we just went over that. The question of whether or not you remove the mask in the antechamber or outside, I think what was being practiced now is that the mask is being removed outside. Um, depending, I guess, if it's in the operating room or not, but I think the, you're in the operating room, certainly the mask is being used outside. Uh, from M MBM, aerosol or micro droplets that can, us, that can traverse procedural masks, greater risk at close proximity. So what's the proper definition differentiating aerosol from droplets? And shouldn't ophthalmology use N95 as a baseline? So I can only tell you as a non-expert that the, the definition between a droplet and aerosol it seems to depend on size, and that size seems to vary quite a bit from 10 to 15 to 20 microns. The bigger they are, the more they're like droplets and will fall to the ground. That's what we seem to know. Specifically in ophthalmology, I could not say. I don't know if, Lily, you have any comment on that. I think that's something that you would have to find out within your own uh, specialty as to what the standard of use is uh, presently. So I don't have any information about ophthalmology, but the aerosolization is the particle, but also requires flow of air across a wet surface. So you need, like, so that's why suctioning creates um, an airflow over a wet surface that increases aerosolization. And the more the flow, the higher the aerosolization. Um, but again, for, for ophthalmology, I don't know. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Carol Chop uh, uses a microscope drape OTL cases in OR to keep aerosols contained in the and the buffalo to evacuate aerosols. I'm not sure I'm understanding all this, sorry. Another possibility for reusing masks, but doesn't seem to be tested yet. Don't know if we have the means to do a test. Okay, well, we can maybe look into that. Um, uh, if you have more information, perhaps you could email it to me, Carol. Thank you. Uh, this is from Tagus Tulandi. I heard this afternoon that MUHC is looking to replace N95 masks. I don't know, uh, Tagus, if you have any more information on that. I don't know if with what. Uh, are, they, are they as good or they're just a different alternative? Uh, I don't know. Well, actually, this is at the meeting at uh, 1 o'clock. Um, and they said that it might be replaced with another mask. 
and it has created some concerns from everybody. So we don't know yet, but certainly I just want to mention it that they might replace it. We don't know how good it is. They, are, they will be testing it, but it, it's just concerning. So we have someone that said that these are Maldex masks. Yeah. I don't have any information on that, but I guess this is why we're doing these sessions to get all of the information we can. So perhaps we uh, internally can look up what these are and what they do. Um, Jean Deschain says N95 is not necessary as a baseline in the clinic, in the ophthalmology clinic. So I guess we will use that as uh, the expert. Um, John Chen, can you make an announcement whether the wearing of a mask in general is desirable, recommended or not? I think it's a good question. Uh, my understanding is that certainly if you think you are symptomatic, you should wear one to prevent or to actually reduce it. Uh, whether or not a mask will prevent or, or someone who is uh, asymptomatic and doesn't have COVID from getting it. If you're doing social distancing, I think that should be, uh, according to what I understand, sufficient. But I, I don't know. I think perhaps one of the issues is the number of masks that it would take for everyone to use them. I don't know, Lily, if you have a comment on that one or not, or if there's maybe someone from infection control that's on the, on the participant list. Uh, so infection control has said no, um, because um, if you are symptomatic, you probably should not be at work. Um, if you um, do social distancing, then you are okay for all uh, droplets. Um, and I think it's, again, a matter of supply also. Um, but no, so far it's very clear that you should not have a mask unless you are um, within two meters of a COVID positive patient. Okay, thank you, Lily. So that uh, confirms a little bit what I said. So I'm, I'm feeling good about that. Uh, the next two questions are about um, what's the best way to clean equipment, I guess, and, and, and keep them clean when you bring them into the room, such as stethoscopes and so on. I think ideally the idea is to keep those things in the room with patients that are COVID positive, so you have them in the room already. I would think right now that from my understanding, an alcohol swab uh, would be the preferential way to, to clean them and disinfect them from COVID. Um, okay, so that seems to uh, complete the questions on the chat. If there's any other burning questions, we can try to see if we can answer them at the end. If not, you can always email us and we'll try to get back to you. Uh, I'm just going to let Lily now continue on with the last part of the presentation, which is uh, doesn't have too much science to it, uh, but maybe can try to help us as we prepare to go to work at work and when we come back home to keep not only ourselves safe, but also our families. So Dr. Le Dr. Le Chappelle, I have a question. I'm Alison from Obstetrics. Um, in, it's very difficult to maintain social distancing in the birthing center when you're in a patient's room. How do we do that unless we wear a mask? And in the second stage of pushing, uh, half the time when they push, you know, so much of saliva and spit is on our face. Uh, so uh, so what, what have you been using then, Dr. Benjamin, in a... We... we in, what are you, you, you... It sounds to me that you should... There's a, a fair amount of potential aerosolization. So if you have a, obviously if you have a COVID positive patient or a patient at risk, then it seems to me you should be wearing an N95 mask and a blue gown. But blue gown we always do and we wear, we should wear, which some of us don't, but I do wear a surgical mask, a procedure mask. But that's one issue. Second issue is when we are in the room, we are so close to the patient. When you examine the abdomen and when you do a pelvic exam, <laughs> Unless we have a mask all the time on, then we are in the patient room. It's very difficult to sort of maintain this social this distance yeah. that so, we keep talking about. So, I think we clarify in terms of 
everyone that is COVID positive, you need to wear a mask with a visor. The we question don't know who is COVID positive when they walk in. Nowadays, patients don't always reveal the symptoms. We had a, we, the last patient was admitted for preeclampsia and she turned out to be COVID positive. So uh, may I may just make a suggestion, Dr. Ben, if you would allow us, we'll bring this up uh, directly with infection control, specifically related to that location. Thank it you. Would, it would seem to me that you should have an N95 mask and a face shield and a blue gown, and, and, it sh and you should be wearing it all the time. But so let me, I mean, I think there are clinical situations that are different from one to the other. That's why we're having this, these sessions. So I'll try to get back to you about that information. Yeah, that would be nice, Kevin. Okay. So I think, uh, can we just continue with the rest of the presentation and then we'll try to get back to the other questions uh, afterwards. Lily? Yeah, so uh, thank everyone for joining. Again, uh, this is safety at work. Next slide, Marco. Um, but it's important that uh, safety at work begins even before you left the house. So a couple of things for you to do before uh, you leave for work is to leave anything non-essential at home your watches your rings um a bag your coat if you can leave all of that at home that's better uh tie your hair back keep your nails short um and then i i just wear my uh work clothes um and then um I try not to bring um i just bring a badge and one credit card if you really need to but no pens nothing else um if you bring a lunch or if you bring work clothes i usually put it either either in a disposable wrapping that you're going to throw out or even better yet i put it in a pillowcase because then you can put everything in there and then wash your pillowcase uh, for your phone you can put it in a ziploc bag that can be discarded at the end of the day i actually find using saran wrap better um, the you don't have much much of a rustle and it uh, it sticks to your phone uh, better next slide and then at work if you either change into your work clothes or your scrub as soon as you arrive and then change into work shoes ideally your work shoes are plastic and wipeable and then you use your PPE as needed. Um, and then when you're gonna walk into the, your patient room, really leave everything that you can outside, your pens, your phones, uh, badges. I never uh, have it hanging. I have it tucked inside um, a pocket. Um, and I think very important is practicing social distancing and getting used to not touching your face. If you look at your colleagues, we are always touching our face all the time. And so that psychological break of learning to not touch your face is very, very important. Next slide. And then after work, uh, when you're still uh, at work, uh, place all your dirty clothes in a bag in that pillowcase that you're going to bring home or if you have scrubs leave it at the hospital to clean and then wash your hands then put on your clean clothes sanitize everything that you can um, and that can be either with a wipe or just with soap and water so for my badge I do my soap and water uh, and then after you've sanitized those things you wash your hands and your arms now and if you have been in a high risk procedure like you were in a full trauma and you think you got splashed you may consider showering at the hospital before coming home next slide and then at home really try not to touch anything um i mean i've read some places where uh they leave their shoes outside they enter let's say through the garage um well one of the things you do is once you get home you remove your shoes, you remove your clothes, you put it hmm. machine door open in the morning so that I can just put it all in. I take a shower um, and then I go down and I close the door to my washing machine, run it once my hands and all that are clean. Um, and then if you need to wipe any surfaces make sure that you use something that has more than 60 percent alcohol um, hydrogen peroxide is also um, recommended um, and then if you have um, 
had high exposure, if you have symptoms or a vulnerable population in your family, um, you need to consider uh, limiting your social interaction with them. And then the last is to practice wellness daily. This is a, a very highly stressful time. Um, and it's a great segue into, we will be offering a follow-up a Zoom session on April 8th, which is a Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, we will have Dr. Olivia C, who will be giving a talk specifically geared to surgeons that is talking about practical tips for building resilience in surgeons. Very, very practical. How do you manage 100 emails? How do you manage texting? How do you manage um, anxious colleagues, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then Marco, if you can just go back to the previous slide. There is a, uh, you know, the, the one with the poster. We've put together a poster that summarizes the safety at work points uh, that will be distributed that you can just bring it up on your phone whenever you need it. Uh, we're also working on a two page poster that summarizes all the PPE information from all these slides. Hopefully that will be out in the next day or two. Um, so all these, um, Cheat sheets will be available uh, shortly also. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Lily. I don't know if there are any other uh, questions. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat uh, section. Uh, Dr. Carrier asked, is Javel's solution enough? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, killing the virus. Uh, so it, it, my understanding is that the, you have to have point, I believe it's 0.1%. And if you use 60 ml in a liter, 60 ml of regular Javex or Javel water in a liter of, of saline, or sorry, liter of water, that should be sufficient. Um, uh, Dr. Chan asks, a thin windbreaker jacket and pants as overall when one goes out and remove upon returning home helps. That sounds like um, it sounds like it could be good. I guess the, the, the thing is you'd still have to treat the windbreaker jacket and the pants as being contaminated. So uh, what I do now when I get home is I take my clothes off and I put them in the laundry bin into a plastic bag. I leave it there for a couple of days and then uh, hopefully somebody will go and pick it up and wash them for me. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Tulandi asks, how about uh, emails? How about mails from post office? Um, I don't know, the, the virus apparently lasts about 24 hours on cardboard, I guess, and on paper. I think it would probably should be okay. Um, are people interested in self-isolating from family if they had an option to stay in a hotel would they want to um i guess it depends if you're positive i think if you're positive then you need to obviously isolate from your family whether or not you go to a hotel i don't know but certainly you have to be isolated in a part of the house uh, so there the fmsq is working on providing hotels to uh workers uh, hopefully we'll get that information out soon, but um, uh, the uh, hotel uh, group is working on that. So Sam, Daniel just texted, it is coming soon. Okay. Um, so there's another one from Josh. Thanks, John. That is a great initiative. Okay, I guess Jonathan was not asking a question. He was giving us a, a solution to a problem. Okay, an offer. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, um, I don't uh, have anything uh, right now to add. I, it looks like the chat room uh, has, uh, oh, I have another question here from Carol. At some centers, they are eliminating paper prescriptions. Um, I imagine you mean pharmacy. Is that what you're talking about? I guess you just call in the order. I don't know how how significant this transmission from paper is, like from money and so on. I, I've looked at it. I don't. I don't think there's a great deal on it. I don't think there's a lot of science to it. I don't know, Lily, what what your take is on it, or Marco. Um, 
that, for example, at the children, if they're in an inpatient, to fax um, prescriptions and not to send handwritten prescriptions down. Um, so I don't know how much science is there, but I do know that um, there's been a lot of requests from pharmacies to call it in or to fax it in. Okay, so I guess we'll do what, uh, what, what's the in thing to do now. Okay, um, well, it looks like it's uh, winding down. Um, so we will mail, email this um, safety at work uh, card that you can put on your phones uh, just to give you some ideas and maybe you want to practice it yourself or you can talk to your colleagues or even email some of us. Um, and uh, don't forget that we're going to be having another uh, session. There's another Department of Surgery Zoom session on Thursday this week. And then we have the uh, resilience session uh, next week on Wednesday. Um, so again, uh, we, this um, session has been recorded. And so for those that would like to see it again, it will be on the link in the Department of Surgery. And I will uh, definitely get back uh, to the uh, OBGYN group. I think uh, through Lily, myself, and Marco, we'll try to get an answer for you with respect to uh, the type of uh, PPE. The one thing I can tell you that we've all seen here is that these recommendations are, are changing. They are very dynamic. And uh, I think they're related to a lot of issues. So we just have to try to follow them as best as we can. And I think the one thing to do is not to lose your judgment in, in, in deciding what it is that you should, uh, you should put on. Clearly, we have to be uh, judicious in using uh, high-end N95 masks. If there is an issue about uh, shortage, then we have to be aware of it. But um, I think also we also have to protect ourselves. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I just wanted to add that um, there's a, a chat here about the different uh, percentages of uh, Javel water uh, sodium hypochlorite and other um, products that can uh, destroy the virus. And so uh, perhaps we can also send that out in an email uh, through the department links. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much and uh, keep safe and uh, we'll see each other again on Zoom. Thanks, Kevin.